Bona tarda. Sí, ara sí. I will make my introduction in Catalan, if this is okay with you. And then, so I'm going to say all the bad things about you, and then you will not understand. Bé, bona tarda. És un plaer per nosaltres estar avui aquí, en una sala d'on estan plena, que veiem que a la mesura que vagi arribant gent, esperem que vinguin cap a davant, com està demanant el ponent. Primer de tot, voldria excusar el president de l'Institut d'Estudis Català, el el doctor Joan Domènec Ros, que estava molt interessat en venir a aquesta xerrada, però li ha sigut impossible perquè té un altre compromís a la mateixa hora. I si compartim amb vosaltres que és la primera vegada que es coorganitza una ponència, un acte com aquest, conjuntament amb totes les filials de l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans. La iniciativa des de l'Associació Catalana de Sociologia, però ha estat coorganitzat i amb interès per totes les filials i això és un moment també històric per a nosaltres. Tots sabem cada vegada més que en l'àmbit de la recerca cada cop donem més importància a la interdisciplinarietat, però també el tema que avui ens porta, que és l'accés obert a la ciència, és un tema que no té fronteres de disciplines, és un tema que ens interessa a tothom. Perdoneu que tinc el... El mòbil. I ara, doncs, voldria presentar-vos a la persona que tenim aquí, que ja s'ha començat a presentar ell mateix, que és el doctor Joan Golinski. El doctor Joan Golinski és doctor en Sociologia de l'Educació per la Universitat de Dalhousie a Canadà i ell primer va ser professor de literatura i tecnologia, una barreja ben interessant, posat en un lloc com aquest, literatura i tecnologia a la Universitat de British Columbia, i després, més endavant, va ser setmana cap a Stanford, o el van fitxar a la Universitat de Stanford, on allà va començar a dirigir el que el Public Knowledge Project, del que suposo que avui també us comentarà, us parlarà una mica, o si no li pregunteu, i també en col·laboració amb la Simon Fraser University. Actualment, a part de dirigir el Public Knowledge Project, també dirigeix el programa de Ciències, Tecnologia i Societat a la Universitat de Stanford i, paral·lelament, ha sigut el creador i s'ha implicat en el desenvolupament de softwares coneguts a nivell mundial com en Open Journal System, el Open Conference Systems i el Open Monograph Press. Per últim, també comentar que amb el Public Knowledge Project estan col·laborant molt activament amb base de dades a Llatinoamèrica, concretament amb Estielo i amb Redalí. Segons ell, després d'haver estat molts anys estudiant el coneixement, es va donar compte que l'important que era donar accés o fer que tot aquest coneixement fos públic, que era una gran necessitat i avui en dia ja no entenem la societat sense aquesta idea. Això és una cosa que potser ens explicarà avui que s'ha fet durant tota la història, una mica el que esperem sentir i tindré moltes ganes de compartir amb ell aquesta tarda. Moltes gràcies per estar aquí. And now, after seeing all these good things about you, no de bad, just, John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martha. I appreciate the welcome, and I'm sure everything you said about me was true. Um, it is a, a great pleasure to be in Barcelona, uh, and in particular to be in this wonderful institution, this uh, nunnery hospital. I want to talk to you, in fact, I want to use this as a prop. I want to pretend this is a theater, um, and this is my stage, because I want to give you a history of access to research and scholarship. I want to talk about the work of nuns and monks. I want to talk about the work of faculty and students. And I want to talk about the human right to knowledge. Okay, so that's the, the theme for today. I was hoping to stand in the spotlight and speak to you, but you did not come to me. I have to come to you. So let me set the stage uh, for this in terms of, of what I want to talk about. I'm talking about open access. Oh, my picture's gone. I'm oh, sorry. That was from 10 years ago. 
I have not aged. Open access is a very particular, specific term. It's a technical term, but I want to make it very broad and historical. So let me start with the narrow technical part. Open access is a term we're using. And I say we, there are tens of us, no, there are hundreds of us, faculty members, scholars. I'm a professor of education. And we think we're the minority. There are only hundreds of us, not millions of us. We think that the research and scholarship that professors do and graduate students do, and maybe undergraduate students do, we think that research and scholarship should be made public. Yeah, exactly. Of course. Like, what is the big deal? It is a huge deal. It is a $10 billion deal. It is a battle that I have been fighting for 20 years. 20 years ago, I discovered, and I, I, let me give you a little more of my background and, and why this is important to me. I want to talk about why the work in the libraries of universities should be available in the public libraries. I just visited a public library, just the next building over. We thought it was the Catalan National Library. We walked in, uh, and it turned out it was the public library because people were having so much fun. And they were talking, and they were moving around. Then we went a couple, just uh, one building down and up the stairs, and there was the National Catalan Library. But there's a connection between those two libraries. And that's a connection I want to talk about in terms of the history of places like this hospital, this monastic hospital. And in terms of a battle that is currently going on and that will be decided over the next five or so years, it is a battle that is going to affect all of your lives, I want to say, directly and indirectly. But where do I come from? Let me give you a little bit of my story in terms of this. I heard Marta mention that I'm from Canada, and it's true, and that I teach in the United States of America. It's not the best of times to be teaching in the United States of America. I went down there in 2007, when in 2008 it became the best time to be teaching in America with Barack Obama as president of the United States. And as we say sometimes in English, all good things must pass, and I'm afraid they have, but I'm not here to be political. I trained as a school teacher. I taught school for 10 years. That's why I'm so loud. That's why I'm here in your face. That's why I'm watching the back row. Yes, thank you for looking up. I taught school for 10 years, and in that time, I taught kids how to read and write do math, and I had every hope in the world for what they were going to read in particular, and they were going to write, and they were going to do some math. I wasn't as thrilled about that part, I have to admit. And then I became a professor of education, and only after I became a professor of education and started to teach teachers did I realize that the kids I had taught we're not going to have a complete access to knowledge. It hadn't occurred to me that the work of the universities, where people make a very big deal about how special and how learned the research is, was not going to be available to my students, except if they went to university. But the minute they left the university, they graduated, and they all did, because I taught them in elementary school, hundred, no, I don't. many of them did not. But I had hopes for them, and I thought that each child I taught had a right to know anything she or he wanted to know. And then I became a professor, and one time I tried to take the research, this is in 1998, you'll have to ask your grandparents, some of you, about this. But in 1998, when knowledge was starting to move online, I decided it was time to work with the newspapers as a professor. I, didn't, I wasn't worried about the newspapers yet. I should have been worried about the newspapers. 
the newspapers were not even, they were just beginning to move online. In 1998, I said, let's make a partnership. I'll bring the research from the university. You do re write newspaper stories about the kids in the school, and we'll work together. One big, happy world. Knowledge from journalism, knowledge from professors. They said yes, reporters. They went into the schools, they interviewed young women who were working on computers. 1998 people, they could only find five. Young women were not working on computers. Young boys were running the computer labs and not making it a friendly place for women, young women. They wrote up those stories, but I failed. I could not live up to my share of the bargain. I could not put the research online to go with the newspaper articles. Because the librarians explained to me, uh, it was embarrassing, they said, you should know this, you're a professor. A professor of education, you don't know we can't share this knowledge? We signed an agreement with the publishers to only keep it in the library. The public can come into the library if they pay for parking. And I was kind of surprised at that. It hadn't occurred to me that all that work I had done with those young kids and all of the work I was doing with teachers had to end when they left the university, had to end if they made it to the university. And when you graduate, you students, hard to tell students or professors here, but when you graduate, those of you who are students, you're going to lose your library privileges. They're going to cut your library card in half, on the stage, no, <laughs> but symbolically, they're going to do that. The last article on your last class is the last piece of research you're going to see. No, because in 1998, I said, there's something wrong with this picture. I'm educating public school teachers and we are cheating those kids. They have access to newspapers, access to books, novels, literature, some nonfiction books. They won't have access to research and scholarship. The books are way too expensive. The journals are way, way too expensive. So in 1998, I decided that I would change my career. I had tenure. I had a permanent job. I could do this. I changed my career, my direction of my research, to say, I'm going to free up all the research in the world. I'm just going to tell all the professors, you should make the research free. And then they're going to agree with me. The library doors are going to explode open. Research is going to be flooding the subways, the buses. probably guess. It didn't work. It just didn't work. I called it, I still call it, the Public Knowledge Project. What was very naive about me is the last word, project. Do you know project? Is pro like, would you go to a university called the Knowledge Project? No. Did the church call itself the Christian project? No. Projects are short term. Projects, you get them done. You move on. 20 years, I am still working on this project. 20 years, and I have, not just me, when I say I, I have to be fair. There were hundreds of us who thought that the research should not be locked up. We saw Napster, we saw music being shared. Have any of you ever illegally downloaded a music song? No, no, good, 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 good. No, okay. You in the back? Can I borrow somebody's phone? I have to call the police. <laughs> so that was happening in 2001 and two and three. Music was being shared and I said, hey, let's share the research. No. 
So what I did in 2001, and Catalan has a, a very important part to play in this story. I'm very proud to be here. In 2001, I said, okay, from 1998 to 2001, I tried to convince my colleagues and the libraries and the publishers to make the research free. I said, hey, look at Napster, look at the music sharing. Look at the movies that are, anyone downloaded? <laughs> no, good, very good. Barcelona, you like, nowhere else in the world. You, you are all going to heaven. From this monastery directly to heaven. Thank you for not downloading any movies illegally. <laughs> In those three years, I was able to convince no one. No one. And so I said, I need to do something. It's not good enough when you want people to change to simply ask them to change. If you're smoking a cigarette, you can't say to people, would you please stop smoking? You've got to show them and demonstrate what the change means. I could make my articles free. I could, and I did. But my articles are not, what can I say? My mother, I've got a cousin at a university, that's two readers, and I wish my children would have a look at them, but no. So that wasn't going to do it. What I said I would do, and this is a lesson for you, if you want people to change, you have to do something to make it easier for them to change. You have to provide an easier way for them to do what they want to do in a way that changes for you, what you want them to change. Or another way to put this is you pretend only to change one thing. So what I did is I found some students just like you, and I had them build a platform for the web this is now 2001. We had a World Wide Web, still around. Do you call it the World Wide Web? No. It used to be called the World, like it took two minutes to get the word up. The word, what are you watching? I'm looking on the World Wide Web. The person's already left the room that you were starting to tell them that this was happening. So on the World Wide Web, we built a platform. We, we actually didn't build it on the web. We built it for the web. We created open source software. That means it's open to be changed, it means it's free to download, in which you could publish journals. It created a platform. It created a platform. Are you watching me on? <laughs> you can't see my face. OK, I'm getting still. It's been a long time. Let's stay focused. I built a platform called Open Journal Systems. This was a platform that we were giving away free, get it? So the journals would do what? If I make this free for you, oh, you don't get the deal? You, oh, the downloader gets the deal. Okay. Then you'll make it free for everybody else. I'll give you this free platform, you put your journal on it, you publish, and you make those articles free. My platform, costs nothing, you download it, you install it, it pops up just like a journal, you put in the title of your journal, the journal of really important knowledge, and you can start publishing. No, you can't. The journal system is built for journals. You don't publish unless there's a review of the article. A blind review, a double blind review. The author doesn't know who the reviewers are. That's one blind. Then the other blind is the reviewer doesn't know who the author is. That's our check on research and scholarship. It distinguishes us from Donald Trump's tweets that do not get reviewed, I hope. I mean, I want to believe they don't get reviewed. Who would review them and let them know? Anyway. So we built a journal system for scholarly work that was peer-reviewed, that was edited, and that was published. And that's how you create change. One way is you build the tools for others. And I said to people, they said, I don't want to put our journal online. I said, I'm only changing one thing. 
Your journal can be exactly like it always was. But this one thing I'm going to change is we're putting it online and it's going to be free. I don't know if you caught that. We're putting your journal online and then you're going to do it free. And so they did. But the first, within I think two years, no more, I got a request about Catalan. Is the journal software available in Catalan? It was available in Spanish and Portuguese, in Latin America, where there had never been expensive journals, where the journals had circulated in Portuguese and Spanish within Latin America on a barter system, sharing. I'll make a journal, you make a journal, we share. So we had it in Spanish and Portuguese, but then I had this request, is your software available in Catalan? And I have to admit my ignorance. I said no. And then I looked up to learn about Catalan. The Basque, I talked about this, we know about we knew because of the violence and the, in terms of the Basque, but Catalan I had to learn about. And they took our software and they translated it because it was open. They translated it because this was a non-commercial system of cooperation. And they put up 500. I did not know there were 500 journals in Catalan. And it showed us that by creating the tools for change, we could support intellectual independence. We could support linguistic independence. We could support those who are resisting the national identity. And as a Canadian, I'm very sensitive to that because we have Quebecois. We have the Quebecois people who are in a similar situation of considering very seriously, less so now than in Catalan, independence, but are very serious about their linguistic independence. And I would not release my software unless it was in French and English. Although the Spanish and the Portuguese, in Latin America in particular, and in Spain, were very quick to translate. And Catalan was about the third language, fourth language, my math is very good, fourth language. And this was an important lesson for us. So what's happened since then? I don't want to take you through the whole history, and I promise to bring in the monasteries. But I've set the stage. You know what I do? As a professor of education, I do work with teachers, but my research is on this question of how to make research open. Let me give you one more fact before I go back to this history, because I can't miss this opportunity of this stage. One more fact about this history is right now, do you know Google Scholar? Good. Yeah. <laughs> You're just doing that, aren't you? You're just tired. Oh, yeah. So Google Scholar, is, and like Google, you can find research online. You definitely. Much of that research, you will have to pay 40 or $50 for one article. It's behind a paywall. And every time you see that paywall, you can say, Walensky failed. <coughs> Me, Walensky, failed. But what's happened since 1998 is half of the literature Half of the research and scholarship is now freely available. Half freely available, half still locked up. So in these 20 years, we've got to the halfway point. It's a long battle. For some of you, it's a lifetime. But that's how things work in this world. You start off saying, I've got a project. I'm going to get it done right away. First thing I'm going to do is start. Second thing I'm going to do, get halfway. Third thing I'm going to do, finish the project. Next project. You think that way. You take classes. You do the homework. You finish your essays. You figure, yeah, I'm ready for the next one. Some things take longer. It's lucky that we live so long. Because 20 years I've been working on this, I and hundreds of other people, and we've gotten halfway. So now, if you look for a research article, for a study you're going to do, because someone is ill in your family, because you're thinking of moving to a new place, because you're concerned. A 
about the economic inequality in Spain. You're concerned about the education of a younger brother or sister. And you look for the research on what the teachers are doing or what they could be doing better. And the chances you'll find an article that you can actually read without paying are now 50-50. So this is an exciting time. It's halfway. I know. Now in a marathon, actually in a marathon you can't rest. You don't see them pulling over halfway through the marathon and saying, oh, man, let's take a break, man. That first half was rotten. Wow, it'll be really good. We'll get our second win, have a cigarette, maybe then we'll take, go down the second. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to keep going. But what I want to do is take a break right now, and I want to tell you why this isn't about illegally downloading movies. A lot of movies? <laughs> illegally downloading movies. This is different. Your right to this research is part of the legacy of this building, this institution, this product of the church, this national monument. And that's because the monasteries and the medieval universities and the early modern universities and the universities that you're participating in are part of a historical tradition in the West. And that historical tradition in terms of learning, began in monasteries. Now, the monasteries were closed. They were gated communities. Not gated in a fancy sense. They had no swimming pools, no delivery. But they were gated communities, and there was no private property. When you entered a monastery, you gave your book to the abbot or abbess, and that became the property of everyone. And the Benedictine monasteries were the most strict about that. It was a communal space. But in the Middle Ages, when learning was at its lowest point, when the libraries of Rome, which were big public libraries, had been destroyed, when books were a rarity, the monasteries protected that learning. And they protected it on the basis of sharing it communally. And you'll notice that this hospital monastery has big gates and has a closed-in space. It was not a public-facing institution. The cloisters, where you walk, are inside, are closed off. When you walk by this building, it looks, oh, ugly, big walls. Nothing interesting inside. And when you come in, it's astounding. The monasteries created a fortress, a castle that protected learning on the basis of being able to share. And they had libraries, small libraries, 100 books. 800, was one of the lar 800 books was one of the largest. In fact, in Spain, it was the Muslims who had the huge library. In Cordoba, in Toledo, there were large Islamic libraries that eventually got translated into Latin that became, I argue, one of the reasons for the universities. There was so much learning in the meeting of Jews, Muslims, and Christians in that period of the 11th and 12th century that it created enormous open access all of a sudden, all of the learning of Islam and the Greeks, which had been translated into Arabic, but not yet into Latin, was translated. Now, this is a lot of history to take in in a short time, this close to dinner. But bear with me. So there was, not in Spain? Oh, I'm not close to dinner in Spain. <laughs> Very good. I'm so sorry. I, I know. My stomach starts at 6 o'clock. Your stomachs don't even start at... 8 o'clock, I know. And lunch, lunch is ridiculous. Sorry, it's not that. <laughs> That's so funny. Yes, not in Spain. That's, I thought you were going to correct me on the Islamic uh, influence of this guy. Uh, no. Um, so the, the monastery starts with this tradition of communal space. And the libraries grew out of that. When you go into a library today, all the books are equally available. My favorite example 
is the university library. If I am working very hard on a book I borrowed from the university library, I, a geriatric professor, sorry, a senior, sorry, senior professor, <laughs> a geriatric professor of education, I'm working very seriously on a work of John Locke's. And if I don't get an email that says a freshman wants to see the book, you know freshman? First year. A first year student wants to see the book that I am using from the library. Do you know what happens? Because of the communal sharing of knowledge, I take that book, not with a smile on my face, I take that book and I slam it shut. I get out of my desk and I stomp down to the library. And I say, where is that student? And the library says to me, <laughs> none of your business. You must share that book. That book belongs to everyone in this community equally well. And this is the principle of the monastery that was closed, of the public library, and of the university library. And so this whole open access movement it's not about the internet. It's not about the worldwide whatever. It's about a long historic tradition that has roots in medieval Spain and in medieval Europe, that has roots in this idea that learning, scholarship, is based on sharing, not based on price, not based on buying that a library is different than a bicycle store. If you have a bicycle, my advice to you is not open access. You will never ride again if you mistake this, make this mistake of saying, oh, Professor Walensky, he thinks open access is so important, my bicycle. This lock, no more. Open access. Say goodbye to your bicycle. But research, if more people take your research, is that bad? If more people read your research, but what if people misread your research? That's a risk. It's democracy. What if your doctor? reads the research and makes a mistake, you sue them right away. What we're arguing for is that every doctor and every teacher and every person who is curious about the world has a right to this knowledge. And that there's no reason to lock it up. Have you got the principle? How is it going to work? How do we get that last 50%? How do I convince the publishers who are making $10 billion, US dollars, okay, 850,000 euros, how do I convince the publishers to make everything free? I want to spend a few minutes explaining this to you. Okay, are, are we agreed on principle? Are you tweeting about the lecture? That's good. <laughs> I hope so. I'm asking if you, no. It's okay. Your free, your freedom of information. How we're going to explain this. So right now, I said to you, half the literature is free. How does that happen? Let's start with the first half. That was really successful, great marathon. I'm really feeling kind of fit. How did we get there? Well, one thing that happened, is, my, is the open journal systems. A lot of people started moving their journals. I, there are 10,000 journals on, on open journal systems, but there are all kinds of other systems too. So we have about 12,000, actually the numbers don't quite add up. There are probably 15 or 18,000 journals that said, hey, we'll make our work free. And you know why we're gonna make it free? Because it's the right thing to do. 
How are we going to pay for it? We don't care. Because we were not getting paid before. I haven't told you this. How much does an author of a research article get for each article they submit? Yes. And so if you publish 10 articles, how much do you get? I'm almost at 100. Still zero. Research articles, the authors don't get paid. What if I review an article and criticize it? Zero. And I try to review every month. Zero. What if I edit a journal? Not zero. I get a free dinner every year. Good dinner. I get, I think the funny thing is, you're allowed to make photocopies. Like, who does that anymore? <laughs> Go to photocopier. Yes, you can photocopy all you want. Not even real. So it's easy to put a journal online for free. Now, the publishers say that's not fair. The publishers say, we organize the peer review. We send emails and say, would you please peer review this article? You say no. Would you please peer review? Yes? OK, good. I'm a publisher, I'm exhausted. I had to send like two emails out. First one said like, no. I had to send it out again. They do that. Then when the article is accepted, so then you, the reviews come in, more than one, two reviews, they always come in like this. Oh no, sometimes they come in like this. One reviewer says, I love it. Another reviewer says, I hate it. And the editor has to say, I think the love was stronger than the hate. And here's how you could make the article better. And believe me, the reviews help the author. Every article I've ever had rejected, sorry, just one minute. Okay. Every article I've ever had, and every article I've ever had accepted has been approved by the review. But the reviewers didn't get paid. The publisher then takes it and they copy edit it. They fix all my spelling mistakes. And in my case, yeah, those are real. And they make it nice. They put it in columns, so tight that you can't even read it. And then they publish it. And they make sure it gets indexed in Google. So they should get some money for that. But these 15,000 open journals say, we can do all that. And we can get a little bit of money from our university to do that. And we can begin to publish for free. But that's not, there are 50,000 journals, probably. We don't even know the exact number. I'm a little embarrassed about that. We, I'm, I study journals. I don't know the exact number of journals. But they change all the time, of course. It's very complicated. Many, many numbers. The journals that, that are publishing open access make their work immediately free for readers. But they're a small proportion. They're probably about 10 to 15% of the articles. I need to get to 50. The publishers, the big commercial publishers, say, OK, we publish 2,000 journals. We think you've got a point about open access. I can see that there's something good about open access. And so in order to make sure that they, sh they put their heart where their head is, where their words are, they don't put their heart where their head is. You see, uh, we don't even say that in English. That's not even an expression in English. They put their, they walk the talk. We have that expression. They walk the talk. They say, you can put up, fussy researcher who wants to be all open access, you can put up the final draft. Have you ever created a draft? Yeah, yeah. The final draft is like what? It's like you ran out of time. It's like, you know, the deadline. The final draft actually is peer reviewed for free. The final draft is not copy edited. It's not beautifully laid out. And they say, OK, knock yourself out. You can put the final draft online. And if people want open access, let them work with the final draft. I think it's terrible. But about 15%, maybe 20% of the articles are final drafts, because the publishers say it's OK. Like the publishers of the police? In some ways, yeah. They own the intellectual property. They own the research. 
done by professors, even though the professors have received public funding for their jobs, for their research grants. Even in my institution, I'm at a private university, still, we're tax exempt. Tax exempt is supported by taxpayers. Nonetheless, the publishers own that research, and they let the final draft. So I've got 30%. What's the last 20%? Did, by the way, did you do the math? 50, 50, 15, 15, 20, leaving 20%. The last 20%, oh, you'll like this, illegal. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm picking up. Stolen research. Absolutely. Some people can't see me at the back there. Oh, you can see me on the screen. Yeah, okay, good. No, you can, it's only the back of my head. And it's not even, yeah, we won't even talk about it. 20, the last 20% is stolen. And what that means is typically the author, me. The publisher said I could put the final draft. It looks hideous. I want to put the published version. Does the publisher say I can put the published version online for free? Go like this. No. They say no. We own the published version. You can't put it online. It depends on some, but the majority say you cannot. And I say, oh, OK, thanks for telling me that. And then I slip it online. It's like, who's going to discover my research? My mother, my cousin at that other university, never my kids. And so 20% of the literature online is illegal. And that's how we got to half. Only this one, one very interesting woman Alexandria Elibakan, she did something really tricky. She had some friends who gave her the passwords to their libraries. I like this. Gave passwords to the libraries, and she said, Ooh, I'm a computer scientist. I could write a script that knocks on the door of the library electronically and says, hey, I'm uh, John Walensky, and I have a membership to this library. I need to get in. And as soon as that script works, the script says, I'll take uh, one of everything. I'm on a really important research assignment, and I need one of every article. What do you got? And she had lots of these passwords. And she pretty soon had 50, actually, she probably started with 20. But it's 20 million articles. She scraped 20, and she's now at 50. Now, is it just her? Lots of questions. Because she's hiding with Edward Snowden in Moscow. Not together. And don't, don't tweet that, please. <laughs> they hardly, they dated maybe. No, no, they're not even fair. Never met. She's created a thing called Sci-Hub. And when I was in Madrid, at a, having a glass of wine, someone took out their phone and said, yeah, look at this, on Telegram, or Telegram. Telegram? Telegram. Telegram. On Telegram, you can get an app that will go to Sci-Hub and get any article for free, like that. So this whole system is kind of broken. I'm saying half the literature is free. Alexandria is saying no. All of it is free, and you can't find me, because I'm in Moscow, where it's like snow all the time. I'm almost invisible. So this idea that the literature is just becoming free legally and illegally is weird. And I am totally opposed to illegal, because if it's a human right to know, it shouldn't be illegal to get the knowledge. That's not a human right. You don't have a human right to illegal drugs. I'm sorry. So we're working for that final half, maybe more like 70% because we want it all legal. How do we convince the publishers to give up? Do you remember how much I'm asking them to give up? Starts with 10 and ends with billion. You got it? I want you to hold that number in your head. I seem to be asking publishers to give up 
$10 billion in subscriptions. And my first thought was yes. I think you should. I think that $10 billion should go to my system, OJS. And then I thought maybe that's not the right attitude. $10 billion. It would have to be a room this big for me to have all that money. I've never seen that kind of money. So then I said, okay, I would do it for half that, $5 billion. I'd be really happy. No, that wasn't the right idea either. What I said is maybe if we're already spending $10 billion a year for about 70% of the literature, Maybe we could start with that. We're already writing the checks. You're writing checks, you don't know about writing checks. We're already paying $10 billion. What if I came up with this idea and said to the publishers, how much does it cost to publish all that literature? Oh no, don't tell me, publishers. I know how much it costs. Everybody in this room knows how much it costs to publish that literature. Checking? Yes, everybody does. I wanted to check. I just peered into your souls. I saw the number 10 with yes, many zeros. How many? Nine? Zeros. Yes, nine zeros. I had to do that in my head. Nine zeros. Ten billion dollars. So my new approach is to say to the publishers, if it only costs you ten billion dollars, and I think it shouldn't, if it costs you ten billion dollars to publish all the literature in the world and lock it away and own it through intellectual property laws, what if I gave you the same $10 billion and said you had to make it open? Could the publisher say no? No. Because how much do they need to publish it again? $10 billion. Am I going to give them the $10 billion? Yeah. So they've got to publish it and they've got to make it open. That's what we want to do. Now, who's going to pay the $10 billion? The same people who are paying it right now. The libraries, the funding councils, some faculty members that have very big grants. We will pay the $10 billion. So I've given up saying, this is wrong, and you're charging too much, although I think that's true. We're now at a point where we're saying that what we want to do is pay the same money to publish the same research in the same journals, only we want to give it to the public for free. We want every doctor and teacher and interested student to have that access, even if it costs $10 billion. Where are we going to find the money? We've already got it the money, we're already spending the money. Now, I think it should be $8 billion to start with. The publishers think it should be $12 billion to start with. And so there's some dispute. Right now, in Germany, the biggest publisher, Elsevier, over 2,000 journals Elsevier publishes. The German research libraries have refused to pay probably 500 million, I would guess, but I don't know, to Elsevier. They're so big. They said two things. We want it cheaper, and every dollar we give you, we want to make the journals open. For Germans, every time a German scholar publishes, that article should be free. And what Elsevier is saying, if that's what you really want to do, you have to pay us more. And this is the first time, though, that the, the subscriptions have ended in Germany and in France. In France, it's Springer Nature, another publisher, a very large publisher. The subscriptions have run out, and the research libraries have said, we will not pay unless we get a good deal. What's interesting, did the publishers, when the subscriptions stopped, did the journals stop coming? Publisher said, we're going to stop the journal. If you don't pay us, 
we're stopping the journal. We're really going to stop the journal now. If you don't pay us today, we are totally going to stop the journal. But you know what the publishers were saying in their head? But what if we stop and it doesn't make a difference? What if we stop and they don't even notice? What if we stop and they start their own journals? So they said, right up to midnight, we're going to stop the journals, we're going to stop the journals, and then one minute after midnight, um, we think you're probably going to negotiate our, and you're going to come to our price very soon. And we think that we will continue the journals, because we're much better people than you are. We're good. We believe in knowledge. And so in France and in Germany, Elsevier in Germany, Springer Nature in, Fran in France have continued to surprise provide the journals, but they are still negotiating. And this is a critical time. So I have a simple solution that cannot happen because I cannot write a check for $10 billion. A check, you don't understand. I cannot PayPal, I cannot uh, iPhone pay a $10 billion bill. It will take some coordination, but it's actually happened. I want to share one example of this not being just a fantasy. Many times I've been accused of having a fantasy about all the knowledge in the world. But in particle physics, any physicists, anyone studying physics? Ah, perfect. Anyone ever had a physics class in high school? None of you had a physics class? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you all must have physics. Particle physics is about electrons, it's about nuclear energy. Particle physics is a very, it's a high energy physics. It's called high energy physics. And that's not just because they're high energy guys and women. It is because of the particles that they work with, study. They have organized 3,000 libraries. And they have said to the publishers, what if we paid you for every particle physics article to be free, how much would it cost? Have you ever heard this argument before? Yes, two minutes ago from me. <laughs> Where do you think I got it? I got it from high energy guys and women, girls and men and women. The particle physicists have an agreement now with Elsevier, the, the notorious Elsevier and other, com other companies and other societies. American Institute of Physics, they have an agreement from 3,000 libraries to write, to pay for every physics article that is, every particle physics article published in the journals. 3,000 libraries agreed to do that. From 40 countries. And what's really neat about it is there are more than 40 countries in the world, and those physicists, and there are not many, but there are physicists and the other 80 countries get to publish for free. And all of the countries in the world get free access to every particle physics article published today because those 3,000 libraries came together. But guess what? Particle physics is a small field. Do you know how small the particles are in particle physics? They're very small. And there are 11 journals publishing that are freely available, at least insofar as they publish. They do, the physics is bigger than particle physics, so some of them publish other articles. But every particle physics article in these 11 journals is free to the world. And that, to me, is a proof of concept. That, to me, is proof of concept, a great entrepreneurial term. When you start a, when you get an app, for your phone, you develop a new app for your phone, you're going to start a business. First, you have a proof of concept. That means you've never sold one. That means it's very small. That means you haven't really tested it yet. But it's a proof that the concept works. 10 journals compared to 50,000 journals, 3,000 live, actually 3,000 libraries is a good number. And in three years, by the way, if you're a library, I want you to learn the lesson of free riders. Do you know this expression, free riders? 
cooperatives have free riders. Anytime there's a free rider is a library that says, are you saying that all the particle physics articles are free? And that we have to write a, a we have to pay with well the other 2,999 journals, uh, libraries? What if one library says, why are we paying? In fact, my library, what am I saying? My library at Stanford University does not belong to those 3,000 libraries. I am so embarrassed. When I go into the library, I'm like this, in case there's a video camera on. When I bring my book back for that freshman one by my John Locke, I go in like this. My library doesn't go in because they disagree with open access. My, lib my chief librarian disagrees with the principle of this cooperative movement for reasons that are complicated and I'm not going to get into, but are interesting. So that idea, so my library is a free rider. Does it get free access to those articles? Yeah, like everybody else. Is it paying its share? No, it's not paying its share. Now the good news is those 3,000 libraries, could have been 3,001, but they're not. There's still 3,000, but in three years, this is a brand new experiment. In three years, those 3,000 libraries have held fast. No one, I, mean, I don't know if no one, but essentially, those numbers are the same. Because each library has a responsibility. Each library is not going to steal a bicycle, and it's not going to quit this agreement. Why? For the same reason that no one stole a book in these monasteries. Because they saw it was everyone's responsibility. And when I take my John Locke book back to the library, I have to be honest, I'm not unhappy. I'm actually thrilled that a freshman wants to study the same thing I want to study. And that that freshman's going to grow up and be just like me. That's maybe a little silly. So what I want to leave you with is this concept that you, right today, are in the middle. And that what you expect of the world, as Catalans, but also as students of learning, what you expect of the world will change the world. And if you expect a right to all of the knowledge produced by the universities, not all of the knowledge produced by Disney, not all of the music of Justin Bieber, but all of the research and scholarship, then that last 50% will be achieved that much more easily. And the libraries will say, we had better do this, because my students expect to have access to this research, and if we don't do it, it's not going to happen. And all of the professors are going to say, we better do this, because if my neighbors, and if the sick child down the street is going to a doctor, that doctor has a right to this knowledge. I expect that doctor to be able to get that knowledge. And if we all expect this right to know that will not end when you graduate, although I hope you graduate in, at the right time, but what I don't hope is that it's the end of your learning. What I do hope is that your learning will continue and that what you're learning in university is something that you can apply. You don't know now what you're going to need five years, 10 years from now. How can you know? A doctor who graduates from medical school, a lawyer, a teacher, how can they know what they're going to need to know? What I want is for them to say, it's OK, because I will be able to find out. I will be able to discover. I won't, the best news of all, I won't have to join a monastery. <laughs> I can have access to this knowledge without celibacy. It's a very rewarding thought. 
So I want to leave you with this idea that you should have an expectation of the human right to know. I want to leave you with the idea that we have only halfway left to go, and it's going to be complicated. And I want to leave you with the idea that I have given you a way too simplistic answer. It is going to be far more complicated for this last half. Will it happen in five years? Will it happen in 10 years? Yes, 10, I'm feeling pretty good about. Five, I don't know. In Europe, you're leading. You have a program called 2020. It's all going to be open in 2020. Does anybody here want to bet on this? I have 10 euros in my pocket right now that says not 2020. But the expectation is important. And that 2020 expectation has caused Germany to say no and caused France to say no. How that will settle, I'm pretty sure it will settle. I'm pretty sure Elsevier will get pretty much what it wants, but not everything, because it's all about negotiation. But there's no negotiation around human rights. No negotiation around the right to know. OK? Has everyone got that? Then we're good. Thank you very much. We have time because you're not going to be eating. <laughs> we have time for some favorable comments or complimentary questions. Yes. Ah. The hospital for poor people paid by the city of Barcelona. And wasn't it the nuns didn't? No, it, they were nuns. Oh. Uh, working here, but it was a civil building. Okay, that's uh, historically from the it's, beginning? It's very interesting. It is very interesting. It, it, so the nuns went home each night yes, to the yes, monastery, yes. Oh. to the abbey. No, 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 they were living here, but uh, working here, but the, the building, the institution was paid by the city of Barcelona. Very good for Barcelona. It was a ho hospital for poor people. Thank, no, that's very good. The nuns, though, still had no private property. You give me that? The nuns had no private property still. They were sharing. No. no. But that, that's very interesting. So, and, and I was talking about doctors getting access to knowledge. The, the nuns would have appreciated what I'm saying about their helping patients. Any other corrections? <laughs> oh, no, I'm open to it. I'm totally open. I'm kidding. Should I, can I bring a microphone back here? This could be a chance to ask a question. Good. <laughs> Physicist. Uh, you, you just mentioned that you're going to put 10 billion yes. for openness. But what, what is your opinion of the, you mentioned the Open Access 2020. Yes. Uh, the project, I guess, led by the Max Planck Society. Yes. They are not uh, achieving the 10 billion. They are suggesting maybe six yes. or seven billion. So what's your opinion? Uh, my opinion is that Actually, I don't need this. I've got one. Um, my opinion is that it's a negotiation project uh, process and that you never start with their price. So when you go to buy a bicycle, remember the bicycle because your bike got stolen? Because of, you know, you, you may try to open access, wrong. When you go to buy a bicycle and they say it's 100 euros, you say, no, 80. So I, I honestly believe, because I have built the software and I have 10,000 journals around the world using the software, and we did a survey, and they're spending 200, the average was $298 an article. $298 an article. Elsevier is charging $3,000 an article. 290, let me round mine off. My articles are 300, theirs are 3,000. Are their articles 10 times better? Are they able to charge $3,000? Yes, because they own so many journals and so much of the back issue. So the price is going to be an argument. And I have decided, this is maybe my politics are weak, that I'm, I'm not as strong as an anarchist, 
But I say that in order to get to the table, in order to get Elsevier in the room, I'm going to start with the 10 billion figure and not say it's wrong. And then I'm going to work very hard to get them to lower their price. More than that, I'm going to compete. I'm going to make OJS better than Elsevier so that authors will put their work in the journals of Hypatia, Hypatia here. They will put their work into journals using OJS that are only $300 an article because our software is better than theirs. And so in a weird way, I'm talking about cooperatives, but I'm also talking about capitalism market competition in terms of the quality of publishing. So th these complicated things about the exact price, I don't want to confuse. I want everyone in the room to remember. What, remember the human right? Yeah. Savoir? No. To know? Yes. Yes, you want the human right to know the price of knowing? Negotiable. Yes. Do you think that, thank you for the conference, it could be even very interesting, do you think that there would be some difference between Anglo-Saxon cultures and Latin cultures about the sharing of knowledge? Uh, in terms of language? Or in terms no, of... No, in terms of interest, of, of sharing, or uh, availability of sharing. So, the, uh, not so much in Spain, but in Latin America, there was, it's always been open. In Latin America, I couldn't give this speech. They would be like, we already opened everything in 2001. Hello. That's oh, right, hola. <laughs> so in the, there are very different economies. But what's interesting about Latin America is they are being influenced by Elsevier. Because now in Latin America, they're saying, we're free, but we're not being recognized. We're not being read enough. Maybe if we put, maybe if we partner at UNAM, you know the Autonomous University of Mexico? Do we know this UNAM, one of the great universities of Mexico City? They hired Elsevier to put their journals on the Elsevier platform because they thought people would say, oh, look it, UNAM, Elsevier, very nice, very cool. And they were paying a lot of money to Elsevier, and many of us are very upset about that. So there are all kinds of complicating global factors at work. The language is an interesting one. I thought that's where you were going, about English, Spanish, Portuguese, Catalan. This is of some relevance to you. I mentioned how interested I was that Catalan was one of the first. I don't think there's a simple solution to that, but I do think that part of what we've learned with OJS is we've helped individual languages and regions and identities to take root. Not every article has to be available to every person in their own language. Well, maybe we have Google Translate to help with that. But that every community, every linguistic community has a right to publish in their language. And what we discovered with open journal systems in Catalan is that our system had to be designed, and we changed the design to make it easy to translate. So that everyone can put it into their own language. The most dramatic example for us was Vietnam. In 2007, there were no Vietnamese journals online. There were printed journals, but none were online. And we worked with the Vietnamese for about a year to put their journals online. And in one month, we put 35, almost 40 journals in Vietnamese online. And that was a huge statement. They were in Vietnamese, but that was their claim to the World Wide Web. And the World Wide Web became much more worldwide when the Vietnamese journals were appearing in Vietnamese. Now, I suspect maybe that'll change a little bit. In fact, some of the Vietnamese journals now are, have English articles in them. And so there is going to be, there are questions about how the global influence. 
I have a second question. Okay. Uh, I don't know in, in your country, but here in Spain, I finished the university 30 years ago, and maybe 10 years ago, I wished to go to the library to get some knowledge about something, and it was not possible to go to the library because you were not a student. And it's forbidden the entrance to the university. And of course, I, I am working since I finished the university, so I am paying the university at this moment. And it's forbidden the university for people. Yeah. Yeah, it's not free the entrance. I don't know if it has changed, but it was forbidden to enter to the university. Uh, in the, I have been a student in three universities. Yeah. And in one of them, that it was UB, in the UB, it was forbidden to enter to the, to the library. I was totally shocked because I think I have been uh, a study here and now I am paying the university for everybody because I have no children. So I am paying for all the other people. With the tax, yes, your and taxes. I have the entrance forbidden. And I was talking to the librarian and uh, she wasn't able to give me any, for me, any real explanation for this because I have my, my uh, when I explained her that I can understand if I was paying, I was uh, an old student, why I can enter to the university. So now you have access, I'm saying, to half the literature, half <laughs> of the research, half. including, <laughs> in, yes, and I'm working really hard to get that second half for you. And in, in case of my business or where I'm working, I am working in the food sector. And I don't know in, in other sectors, but in my case, most of the main uh, journals are not free. No. Uh, or or uh, the, the editions that are free are the, the old one. If you want to access to the uh, newer uh, reports, or etc., they are not free. So I think that there are too much to do. I still In my much point of view, because I believe the same that you. Well, I, I have another hour before dinner, maybe two. <laughs> I, I can get to started on, on, on doing that. There, there's a question right here. Oh, here. Oh, now we're getting questions. Great. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for your very, very inspiring and motivational and talk. It was very, very nice. And, and this message that you really gave us to us of yeah, the, the right uh, to have to have access to, to knowledge. And well, it, the, my question is very related to what uh, he asked and maybe you have uh, answered to it. Uh, I was wondering that um, resistances came not always from publishers, but also sometimes from authors, that authors uh, have these resistances to publish in open access, maybe because of the prestige of uh, publishing in, in some type of journal because uh, open access journals right now uh, are not uh, top rank situated or I don't know. Yes. Just if you can comment on that or... I can. If, yeah. So uh, it's, it's a very good question. It's the, the prestige uh, of the journals. Are we only getting the bad stuff in the free? And we were talking, uh, I was talking with the reporter. Did you, I don't know if your parents, did your parents ever tell you this, that if, it, if you don't pay for it, you won't value, it's not worth anything? Yes, here too, your parents. We have the same parents, we have twins separated at birth. Yes, so that's not the case anymore. Just let me oh. ask one thing. Okay. I'm not saying that it's good or bad the prestige. I just want to put the topic on the table. Yes, and the topic, and so right now, some of the very best journals are open access. Mm -hmm. The highest ranked journal in biology I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, is a journal called Boss Biology. The most cited, most used journal, and it is free. The highest impact journal, the, the most prestigious journal in medicine is the New England Journal of Medicine. Very English, very American. It's free, but after six months. They keep everything locked up, so if you're sick, you have to kind of wait <laughs> until six months, and then you can discover what's wrong with you if it's in that journal. I can't use that joke anymore. Uh, so the, there is no longer that question. Nature is the highest in science. Nature has a whole open access journal called Scientific Reports. So it, and it will accept money, $5,000, and your article, if you're a researcher, you can pay them $5,000, we'll make it open. 
So the open part has now become, everyone's recognized it as a goal. I didn't tell you that part, that the publishers, Elsevier and Springer, talk all the time about how important open is. They agree with open on their terms at their price. Thank you for that question. We actually have one there and then one here. And we have to, no, she, she was before. I believe that knowledge and information is a, a source of uh, power. So my question is, do you think that the people that already, that this is small, uh, uh, yeah, these people that already have access to information, do you think this is a way of controlling the rest for, I'm not talking about some super big, but I think that having more access of this open access is going to give power to people that maybe they don't want to. Yes, yeah, so that's part of the Foucault, or we were talking about Michel Foucault and the knowledge and power. So, the very famous philosopher, French philosopher. So, knowledge is power, that's for sure. And this movement, open access, is very much a democratic movement. We don't want that to be the case. But the, the battleground is also knowledge is economic power today. Yeah. That today's economy is run on intellectual property. And part of what I've tried to do with this history of the monastery, which I mistakenly thought I was in a monastery, but that's okay. A, I, I love the idea of uh, hospitals for poor people. The, the idea of the monastery is, is that the, the, the learning is separate from the economy. That the monastery existed apart from the feudal economy. And the power of the nobility power of the lords was separate from the monastery. And the lords would give land to create the monastery as a world that was separate. So I am saying yes, knowledge is power, and that this move, everybody has human rights are against that kind of thing. Normally, any human right. This human right in particular is against the knowledge is power. The economic and intellectual property is the stumbling block. Okay, now it's your turn. Uh, well, I work in a hospital, in Hospital Clinic of Barcelona, I don't know. So there's mm, like our platform of free knowledge for surgeons called ICE Channel that uh, teaches on live streaming, I don't know if it's well said, uh, to all the surgeons in the world that subscribe free to this page, and um, they take advantage of the, I don't know how to say, mm, the no. industry that's pro that provides technology to the surgeons. Yes. They can have, uh, they can take a look on the interest of the different surgeons around the world, so they can go there and provide the technology or at least make publicity of that. What do you think about taking advantage of publicity of the interest that the people have, uh, uh, so, <laughs> the people have of their knowledge? I don't know if so. The I, surgeons, the surgeons, uh, that research is sponsored. Has a, a sponsor. Well, uh, the surgeon doesn't pay to watch the surgery live uh, streaming, but um, I don't know, Philips can say, well, uh, this group of surgeons in India are very interested in this kind of surgery, so we'll go there and try to sell our technology. Ah, oh, the Philips, Philips, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, for example. Yeah, yes, yes, so, I, so I'm trying to separate that out. Um, there's definitely a need for the technology, and they should not be trading the knowledge for the technology. So that's exactly a similar kind of situation with the knowledge, I'm saying that there is, um, I'm actually saying that it's all intellectual property, but that the, proper, the intellectual property of the university, of the medical researchers, is a different kind of intellectual property than Philips machinery, and that the uh, phone, the Samsung and the Apple phone, those are different, and Justin Bieber, don't forget Justin, Justin is a different kind of, Justin is producing a different Canadian. <laughs> 
tattoo. Justin Bieber is a different kind of intellectual property because every song he sings, he gets a dollar, a Canadian dollar. Yeah. And, but the researchers are working on a different economy. So part of the big idea behind this that I didn't go into is could there be a different class of intellectual property that protects research and scholarship and separates it out and says that it is wrong to lock this up. Your bicycle, Justin Bieber, lock them up. Research and scholarship, no. A different, so that, uh, I sometimes do make that argument that there should be a change to the law. But that's, that's a more complicated argument. Well, I find interesting that they are sharing their surgery knowledge uh, by going through this publicity interest. Yeah, I, 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 I appreciate. Yeah, I mean that, that's a complicated situation. Yeah. Um, but I, but I'm trying to make a, a, an important distinction. Thank you. Thank you. Well, loss is not free. It's free for people consulting, but it costs between two thousand and three thousand dollars for each article you publish in plus. Oh, plus, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's it. One. Uh, the second thing, or perhaps it's not, the perhaps you don't know the initiative of the University of Barcelona, no. and the main uh, representative, the chief of this, is here in the room, in which uh, you published. Uh, for in open, in open access yes. or paying for this, you return not all, but most of the, if they get money, of the, the, oh, the, the money that you open. APC. Yeah, you see, well, but it's in any journal, they yes. justify this, and it's a good initiative, but the problem is not enough money, I think, uh, to pay well, for all the money. I follow this uh, topic, and especially in the um, European community. And now, Carlos Moedas, he has a lot, perhaps uh, uh, you must know. Yes. He already produced three books on this, with the uh, this ISA. But my feeling, and I know perfectly, Ken, both Springer and, uh, and, um, and uh, Springer's name now, Elsevier, they are more, when they, all this movement started in 2004, the Prague uh, Declaration, they, uh, they were uh, having money, but they are stronger now. They are making more journals. They are taking both. They have the same, the same subscription, and they, well, it's free, but you pay 5,000. Yeah, no. And the other one is not a question, but uh, several, uh, well, many of the institutions of the and learned societies yes. were depending on the subscription. Yes. Uh, and this is a problem that, are, well, in the case of uh, Royal Society, is nothing. They are paying and they are, but it's very difficult to publish. But many uh, small societies couldn't do this because they are going because they have no money to support the society with the exception of. Yeah. The, the societies, uh, that's a complicated question, and, and I'm not sure everyone would, would be. Familiar with this. The scholarly societies, when they get together, all of the people who study butterflies um, or whatever form a society, and they would sell their journal as a way to support the society, the Society of Butterfly Studiers um, or Entomologists or whatever. Um, and so that, that, that group says, well, what are we going to do if we can't sell our journal anymore? Um, and I say, well, a little complicated, but I say, first of all, um, your members who got the free journal don't need to anymore because the journal's online from their library. And they cannot depend any longer on giving out a journal. The second thing I say is, how much were you getting from those subscriptions? Well, it turns out you were getting part of the $10 billion, only it was only $5,000, and that we're still willing to support that. So my position is still going to be that we're willing to give the societies and the publishers the same amount of money. We're not going to ask the authors to do this. 
the APC, because the authors are lousy at doing that. They don't have time to negotiate a better price. They just want to get published. And so the funding agencies, the European Commission, the very major one in this region, this continent, but the Spanish Research Council or whatever organization is paying the grants should be paying the publishers directly. Because we have this thing where authors can pay $3,000 to the publisher, and it's worked really well when authors have very large grants. But it's not working very well where they don't. And so it's worked for 10 years, 15 years, to the points well taken, uh, but it only works with a very small group who get very large grants that I'm very, very jealous of. And so my response is, let's not work with individuals getting grants, let's work with the funding agencies that give the money to the researcher to give to the publisher. Let's have the funding agency keep all its money and say, let's negotiate. The, the funding agency will pay for every article that it sponsors, but it will pay on a negotiated basis. Thank you for your attention. Um, in the previous seminar we shared, uh, we talked about one of the Hippopatia journals, and it was social impact of research. And my question is about, do you keep track of the social impact of open access? Yes, we keep track of the social impact of open access. What does it mean when you publish open access? What happens if you switch? from a subscription journal that's locked to an open access journal. Let me do a little research. How many people think your readership goes down if your journal is free? How many think it goes up? Okay, we have 20, 18, 18 social scientists. How many think it stays the same? Good. The readership goes up. Now, the readership goes up, how much? Well, it differs in different fields, um, but I've never seen, have I seen one lower than 50%, 25%? I've seen cases where it triples. Three times as many readers in terms of impact by opening it. But the big question is, will other scientists use your work if it's free and open? Will they quote your work? Because I'm all about getting quoted. Actually, I'm all about getting tweeted. Oh, you are? Okay, good. Then I'm okay. So it, the, what happens is, it's a big debate, but it looks like that you get quoted more often if your work is freely open. The, the woman who stole all the research, Ellie Bakken, remember her? Many people are downloading her work even when they have access from the library. They're using the free copy because it's so easy to get on Telegram rather than going through their library. So we have a number of studies. It's controversial about the number of times they get cited, because it differs. Every study, we don't have a, like, um, when we do research, we get a lot of studies that converge. We're not getting a lot of studies that converge. We're getting some that say, the readership, everyone agrees. More readership, not everybody agrees on the citation. Of society. Yeah, so we don't have, so in Latin America, remember everything was free in Latin America? We did a survey of, of the articles, we had a pop-up question in the articles, and 25% of the articles in Latin America are being read by non-university people. So does that social impact? Does it change their lives? We don't know. But the fact that they opened a research article, 25% of the articles that are open, as a teacher, me, that's, that's huge. I don't ask for anything more. If every one of my kids in the grade five classroom came in with an article under their hands, in their hand, tears welling up in my eyes. <laughs> I don't ask for anything more than they, they are interested in research. Now, I want to believe that the doctors who download the articles, we did. We gave doctors articles free for a year. One more experiment. We gave all the doctors, all the doctors, 336 doctors, 336 doctors, we gave them free access 
to the whole of Stanford Library, which is very big, online. They, did, they could sit in their car and get all of Stanford University Library in their car, even if it was a small car. What happened? Two-thirds of the doctors didn't look at a single article. I don't want to go to those doctors. One-third, are you doing the math with me? One-third of the doctors looked at an article every, on average every week. They looked at an article every one-third. And they looked at them to help them make a decision about a patient. But not only that. They looked at articles to educate other doctors. They looked at articles to consider the practices of the hospital, the procedures. They looked at articles just to look at articles. So that's the social impact. What we need to do is to see if those doctors save more lives. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. That's a complicated study as they're trying to save a patient's life. And you're saying, did you read any articles about this? Oh my God, the patient died. I hope you didn't read any articles about this. No, that's a complicated study. Thank you, everyone, very much. It's not dinner yet? Huh? Oh. Yes, I'm happy. Explain like a, a scenario of the, for the future, like the 10 billion, shifting 10 billion to one side to the other one. But I think there is another scenario for the future okay. that I think it's close to, for instance, in Europe, is those new publishing platforms. So the question when we talk about open access at the end is, do we need journals? Do we need publishers? Ah. And, and now, for instance, in the UK, we have this uh, welcome open research. Yes, yes. The Bill and Melinda Gates are opening also the publishing, yes. and even the European Commission is it's not tendering. Opening, yes. uh, so, what do you think about that? I, I, I think this, uh, the journals are more than just publishing. That they, uh, the journal represents a community. That we, we have an editor that we know, we have associate editors, we have a journal where we associate our work. So I think there's more to it. Um, the other thing is that we have a, a long tradition. Like, I don't want to see nature go away. I don't want to see cell go away. There's just, it's a long intellectual tradition. The philosophical transactions of the Royal Society are in 300 years old, or 350 years old. So I think there is an argument. 353, my math is so bad. 350, that was a pretty good guess. I was three years off. 353 years. So I, I think the idea is contributes to a sense of threat to the publishers, the truth is, and will be a negotiating point. My hope is, and this is very important for developing countries, that you build a research culture within the developing country of reviewers and editors. And if we have a single big platform, no. So that's my feeling. If it's the only way to go forward, maybe. But it's not my first choice. People go have dinner. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Thank you very much, uh, Johnny, for this inspiring and amusing <laughs> lecture.